YouTube Part 5 What does the Bible really teach about Israel? Hi, my name is Jan Egel Goldbranson and I'm coming to you from Victoria, BC, Canada. Chapter 14 Living in the Last Days Let's take a look at what the Bible describes as the last days. 1 Peter 1 God chose him for this purpose long before the world began, but only recently was he brought into public view. In these last days, as a blessing to you, And we are looking at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. And we're going to look at three different translations just to get the full meaning. But he has appeared once and for all time. He has come at the time when God's work is being completed. He has come to do away with sin by offering himself. But now, at the end of the ages, he has appeared once for all to remove sin by his sacrifice. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. When did Jesus come? When God's work was being completed at the end of the age, at the culmination of ages, this is not talking about 2020 or 2120. It's talking about the end of Judaism. Acts chapter 2.17. We're reading from the NIV. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In the King James Version, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So the question is, when was these last days when God poured out his spirit? Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In the last days, where the time of the birth of the church, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, that was the last days. Hebrews chapter 1, God's supreme revelation. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Second Timothy. But mark this, or realize this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, 
having the form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. Paul is writing to his son in the Lord, Timothy, that he was urged to stay and teach in Ephesus. Understand this, he says. Terrible times are coming. Have nothing to do with these people. Obviously, this time period is related to the time period where Timothy was in Ephesus, roughly 2,000 years ago. Is Paul prophesying about the future of the world that is coming two, three thousand years later in this letter to Timothy? Absolutely not. This warning had what we call reader relevance. It was all about there and then. Why are so many Bible teachers using 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5? There will be terrible times in the last days to describe the time we are living in now. Because they are dispensationists and misinformed on when the last days took place. They have been led to believe the world is going to get worse and worse until Jesus returns, that he is coming to save a losing and struggling church. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible is teaching that the end times or last days was 2,000 years ago. The time period Jesus described was not the end of the world, but the end of the old covenant, the end of Judaism. And what came as an eternal replacement? The church. The church that operates under the new covenant and the new covenant only. The church of Jesus Christ is going to grow and spread all over the world. When Jesus returns, he is going to find a healthy, prosperous, and victorious church. The longer he waits, the stronger the church will become. The grace revival is already well on the way. Chapter 15, David's Fallen Tabernacle, or Shelter, or Tent. Let's start with the prophet Amos' old prophecy. Listen, people of Israel, to this funeral song which I sing over you. Virgin Israel has fallen never to rise again. She lies abandoned on the ground and no one helps her up. It is game over for Israel. A new Israel will rise, also called the church. Amos chapter 5, verse 6. Seek the Lord and live, or... He will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them. The prophet Amos is prophesying, Believe in Jesus and live. Reject him and die. It all played out exactly this way in the years 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. To live in this context is a spiritual life. The alternative was spiritual death, destruction. 
Listen, you wonderful people. Flag waving, dancing, Jewish festival lovers. Listen what the prophet Amos has to say in chapter 5. Amos 5.21, it is God talking. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Listen up, church of today. Do not go back to the Jewish festivals. It might feel right, it might feel spiritual to your religious mind. But God hates it. Amos 5.15 Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Yes, a remnant, a group of Jesus-believing Jews became the fathers of the church. Men like Peter and Paul, the disciples, the 120, the 3,000, the 5,000, and the 144,000. Amos chapter 9, Israel's restoration. In that day I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord. Who will do these things? What does this all mean? Well, Jesus' disciples, James and Simon, explains to us what it means. Acts chapter 15. When they finished... James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles who bear my name says the Lord who does this these things things known from long ago did you catch that the restoration of David's fallen tent is a chosen people from the Gentiles and a remnant of Jews, also called the Church. This prophecy is not talking about the physical Jewish people establishing themselves in the land of Israel or Canaan. Let's look at five characteristics from the Old Testament from 1 Chronicles chapter 16 that describes what David's fallen tent is really all about. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. Comments. The ark, a symbol of Christ, was in the midst of the ark. It was accessible. 
Matthew chapter 18. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. The ark was not hidden behind a curtain. It was accessible. Jesus is accessible. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering, one offering, and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. The one offering was Christ. In Moses' tent, the offerings went on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Comments. There was singing and music in David's tent. Not so in Moses' tent. Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim his greatness. Tell the nations what he has done. Comments. The nations, the Gentiles, were included in what Jesus has done. David's tent was not for Jews only. The story of David's fallen tent. The purpose and selection of Israel was not for them to be unique and isolated, but through them, through Jesus, all the nations will be saved. Genesis 12, verse 3. So the conclusion is, Jesus is Israel. The church is Israel. Even Peter did not get it until God gave him a revelation that nothing or no one was no longer unclean. The Gentiles were now included in Israel. Acts chapter 10. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against a law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. The law of segregation had come to an end. There is no longer a place for any group or race to be proud, superior, arrogant, or nationalistic. There is no longer a place for any group or nation or race to be proud, superior, better than others, Arrogant, patriotic, nationalistic. There is only one nation left that matters. The nation of the church. The body of Christ. This concludes YouTube Part 8. Thank you for listening. 
please move on to YouTube part 9 in this series. What the Bible really teaches about Israel. My name is Jan Egel Goldbranson, and I'm coming to you from Victoria, BC, Canada. My email, goldbranson at islandnet.com. Your comments will be appreciated. YouTube, Part 8. What does the Bible really teach about Israel? 